section six of madame chrysanthème by pierre lotti this librivox recording is in the public domain book three chapter thirty seven complications at first it was only to chrysanthème's guitar that i listened with pleasure now i am beginning to like her singing also she has nothing of the theatrical or the deep assumed voice of the virtuoso on the contrary her notes always very high are soft thin and plaintive she often teaches oyuki some romance slow and dreamy which she has composed or which comes back to her mind then they both astonish me for on their well-tuned guitars they will pick out accompaniments in parts and try again each time that the chords are not perfectly true to their ear without ever losing themselves in the confusion of these dissonant harmonies always weird and always melancholy usually while their music is going on i am writing on the veranda with the superb panorama before me i write seated on a mat on the floor and leaning upon a little japanese desk ornamented with swallows in relief my ink is chinese my inkstand just like that of my landlord is in jade with dear little frogs and toads carved on the rim in short i am writing my memoirs exactly as m sucre does downstairs occasionally i fancy i resemble him a very disagreeable fancy my memoirs are composed of incongruous details minute observations of colours shapes scents and sounds it is true that a complete imbroglio worthy of a romance seems ever threatening to appear upon my monotonous horizon a regular intrigue seems ever ready to explode in the midst of this little world of mousmes and grasshoppers chrysanthème in love with eve eve with chrysanthème oyuki with me i with no one we might even find here ready to hand the elements of a fratricidal drama were we in any other country than japan but we are in japan and under the narrowing and dwarfing influence of the surroundings which turn everything into ridicule nothing will come of it all chapter thirty eight the height of sociability in this fine town of nagasaki about five or six o'clock in the evening one hour of the day is more comical than any other at that moment every human being is naked children young people old people old men old women everyone is seated in a tub of some sort taking a bath this ceremony takes place no matter where without the slightest screen in the gardens the courtyards in the shops even upon the thresholds in order to give greater facility for conversation among the neighbours from one side of the street to the other in this situation visitors are received and the bather without any hesitation leaves his tub holding in his hand his little towel invariably blue to offer the caller a seat and to exchange with him some polite remarks nevertheless neither the mousmes nor the old ladies gain anything by appearing in this primeval costume a japanese woman deprived of her long robe and her huge sash with its pretentious bows is nothing but a diminutive yellow being with crooked legs and flat unshapely bust she has no longer a remnant of her little artificial charms which have completely disappeared in company with her costume there is yet another hour at once joyous and melancholy a little later when twilight falls when the sky seems one vast veil of yellow against which stand the clear-cut outlines of jagged mountains and lofty fantastic pagodas it is the hour at which in the labyrinth of little grey streets below the sacred lamps begin to twinkle in the ever open houses in front of the ancestors altars and the familiar buddhas while outside darkness creeps over all and the thousand and one indentations and peaks of the old roofs are depicted as if in black festoons on the clear golden sky at this moment over merry laughing japan suddenly passes a sombre shadow strange weird a breath of antiquity of savagery of something indefinable which casts a gloom of sadness and then the only gaiety that remains is the gaiety of the young children of little muskos and little musmes who spread themselves like a wave through the streets filled with shadow as they swarm from schools and workshops on the dark background of all these wooden buildings the little blue and scarlet dresses stand out in startling contrast drolly bedizened 
drolly draped and the fine loops of the sashes the flowers the silver or gold topknots stuck in these baby chignons add to the vivid effect they amuse themselves they chase one another their great pagoda sleeves fly wide open and these tiny little mousmes of ten of five years old or even younger still have lofty headdresses and imposing bows of hair arranged on their little heads like grown-up women oh what loves of supremely absurd dolls at this hour of twilight gambol through the streets in their long frocks blowing their crystal trumpets or running with all their might to start their fanciful kites this juvenile world of japan ludicrous by birth and fated to become more so as the years roll on starts in life with singular amusements with strange cries and shouts its playthings are somewhat ghastly and would frighten the children of other countries even the kites have great squinting eyes and vampire shapes and every evening in the little dark streets bursts forth the overflow of joyousness fresh childish but withal grotesque to excess it would be difficult to form any idea of the incredible things which carried by the wind float in the evening air chapter thirty nine a lady of japan my little chrysanthem is always attired in dark colours a sign here of aristocratic distinction while her friends oyuki san madame tuki and others delight in gay striped stuffs and thrust gorgeous ornaments in their chignons she always wears navy blue or neutral grey fastened round her waist with great black sashes brocaded in tender shades and she puts nothing in her hair but amber-coloured tortoiseshell pins if she were of noble descent she would wear embroidered on her dress in the middle of the back a little white circle looking like a postmark with some design in the centre of it usually the leaf of a tree and this would be her coat of arms there is really nothing wanting but this little heraldic blazon on the back to give her the appearance of a lady of the highest rank in japan the smart dresses of bright colours shaded in clouds embroidered with monsters of gold or silver are reserved by the great ladies for home use on state occasions or else they are used on the stage for dancers and courtesans like all japanese women chrysanthem carries a quantity of things in her long sleeves in which pockets are cunningly hidden there she keeps letters various notes written on delicate sheets of rice paper prayer amulets drawn up by the bonzes and above all a number of squares of a silky paper which she puts to the most unexpected uses to dry a teacup to hold the damp stalk of a flower or to blow her quaint little nose when the necessity presents itself after the operation she at once crumples up the piece of paper rolls it into a ball and throws it out of the window with disgust the very smartest people in japan blow their noses in this manner chapter forty our friends the bonzes september the second fate has favoured us with a friendship as strange as it is rare that of the head bonzes of the temple of the jumping tortoise where we witnessed last month such a surprising pilgrimage the approach to this place is as solitary now as it was thronged and bustling on the evenings of the festival and in broad daylight one is surprised at the death-like decay of the sacred surroundings which at night had seemed so full of life not a creature to be seen on the time-worn granite steps not a creature beneath the vast sumptuous porticoes the colours the gold work are dim with dust to reach the temple one must cross several deserted courtyards terraced on the mountain side pass through several solemn gateways and up and up endless stairs rising far above the town and the noises of humanity into a sacred region filled with innumerable tombs on all the pavements in all the walls a lichen and stone crop and over all the grey tint of extreme age spreads like a fall of ashes in a side temple near the entrance is enthroned a colossal buddha seated in his lotus a gilded idol from forty-five to sixty feet high mounted on an enormous bronze pedestal at length appears the last doorway with the two traditional giants guardians of the sacred court which stand the one on the right hand the other on the left shut up like wild beasts each in an iron cage they are in attitudes of fury with fists upraised as if to strike 
and features atrociously fierce and distorted their bodies are covered with bullets of crumbled paper which have been aimed at them through the bars and which have stuck to their monstrous limbs producing an appearance of white leprosy this is the manner in which the faithful strive to appease them by conveying to them their prayers written upon delicate leaflets by the pious bonzes passing between these alarming scarecrows one reaches the innermost court the residence of our friends is on the right the great hall of the pagoda is before us in this paved court are bronze torch holders as high as turrets here too stand and have stood for centuries cyca palms with fresh green plumes their numerous stalks curving with a heavy symmetry like the branches of massive candelabra the temple which is open along its entire length is dark and mysterious with touches of gilding in distant corners melting away into the gloom in the very remotest part are seated idols and from the outside one can vaguely see their clasped hands and air of rapt mysticism in front are the altars loaded with marvellous vases in metalwork whence spring graceful clusters of gold and silver lotus from the very entrance one is greeted by the sweet odour of the incense sticks unceasingly burned by the priests before the gods to penetrate into the dwelling of our friends the bonzes which is situated on the right side as you enter is by no means an easy matter a monster of the fish tribe but having claws and horns is hung over their door by iron chains at the least breath of wind he swings creakingly we pass beneath him and enter the first vast and lofty hall dimly lighted in the corners of which gleam gilded idols bells and incomprehensible objects of religious use quaint little creatures choir boys or pupils come forward with a doubtful welcome to ask what is wanted matsu-san don't san they repeat much astonished when they understand to whom we wish to be conducted oh no impossible they cannot be seen they are resting or in contemplation orimas orimas say they clasping their hands and sketching a genuflection or two to make us understand better they are at prayer the most profound prayer we insist speak more imperatively even slip off our shoes like people determined to take no refusal at last matsu san and donata san make their appearance from the tranquil depths of their bonze house they are dressed in black crepe and their heads are shaved smiling amiable full of excuses they offer us their hands and we follow with our feet bare like theirs to the interior of their mysterious dwelling through a series of empty rooms spread with mats of the most unimpeachable whiteness the successive halls are separated one from the other only by bamboo curtains of exquisite delicacy caught back by tassels and cords of red silk the whole wainscoting of the interior is of the same wood of a pale yellow shade made with extreme nicety without the least ornament the least carving everything seems new and unused as if it had never been touched by human hand at distant intervals in this studied bareness costly little stools marvellously inlaid uphold some antique bronze monster or a vase of flowers on the walls hang a few masterly sketches vaguely tinted in indian ink drawn upon strips of grey paper most accurately cut but without the slightest attempt at a frame this is all not a seat not a cushion not a scrap of furniture it is the very acme of studied simplicity of elegance made out of nothing of the most immaculate and incredible cleanliness and while following the bonzes through this long suite of empty halls we are struck by their contrast with the overflow of knick-knacks scattered about our rooms in france and we take a sudden dislike to the profusion and crowding delighted in at home the spot where this silent march of barefooted folk comes to an end the spot where we are to seat ourselves in the delightful coolness of a semi-darkness is an interior veranda opening upon an artificial site we might suppose it at the bottom of a well it is a miniature garden no bigger than the opening of an oubliette overhung on all sides by the crushing height of the mountain and receiving from on high but the dim light of dreamland nevertheless here is simulated a great natural ravine in all its wild grandeur here are caverns abrupt rocks a torrent a cascade 
islands the trees dwarfed by a japanese process of which we have not the secret have tiny little leaves on their decrepit and knotty branches a pervading hue of the mossy green of antiquity harmonizes all this medley which is undoubtedly centuries old families of goldfish swim round and round in the clear water and tiny tortoises jumpers probably sleep upon the granite islands which are of the same colour as their own grey shells there are even blue dragonflies which have ventured to descend heaven knows whence and alight with quivering wings upon the miniature water lilies our friends the bonzes notwithstanding an unctuousness of manner thoroughly ecclesiastical are very ready to laugh a simple pleased childish laughter plump chubby shaven and shorn they dearly love our french liqueurs and know how to take a joke we talk first of one thing and then another to the tranquil music of their little cascade i launch out before them with phrases of the most erudite japanese i try the effect of a few tenses of verbs desideratives concessives hypothetics in bar while they chant they dispatch the affairs of the church the order of services sealed with complicated seals for inferior pagodas situated in the neighbourhood or trace little prayers with a cunning paintbrush as medical remedies to be swallowed like pills by invalids at a distance with their white and dimpled hands they play with a fan as cleverly as any woman and when we have tasted different native drinks flavoured with essences of flowers they bring up as a finish a bottle of benedictine or chartreuse for they appreciate the liqueurs composed by their western colleagues when they come on board to return our visits they by no means disdain to fasten their great round spectacles on their flat noses in order to inspect the profane drawings in our illustrated papers the vie parisienne for instance and it is even with a certain complacency that they let their fingers linger upon the pictures representing women the religious ceremonies in their great temple are magnificent and to one of these we are now invited at the sound of the gong they make their entrance before the idols with a stately ritual twenty or thirty priests officiate in gala costumes with genuflections clapping of hands and movements to and fro which look like the figures of some mystic quadrille but for all that let the sanctuary be ever so immense and imposing in its sombre gloom the idols ever so superb all seems in japan but a mere semblance of grandeur a hopeless pettiness an irresistible effect the ludicrous lies at the bottom of all things and then the congregation is not conducive to thoughtful contemplation for among it we usually discover some acquaintance my mother-in-law or a cousin or the woman from the china shop who sold us a vase only yesterday charming little musmes monkeyish looking old ladies enter with their smoking boxes their gaily daubed parasols their curtsies their little cries and exclamations prattling complimenting one another full of restless movement and having the greatest difficulty in maintaining a serious demeanour chapter forty one an unexpected call september third my little chrysanthème for the first time visited me on board ship to-day chaperoned by madame prune and followed by my youngest sister-in-law mademoiselle la neige these ladies had the tranquil manners of the highest gentility in my cabin is a great buddha on his throne and before him is a lacquer tray on which my faithful sailor servant places any small change he may find in the pockets of my clothes madame prune whose mind is much swayed by mysticism at once supposed herself before a regular altar in the gravest manner possible she addressed a brief prayer to the god then drawing out her purse which according to custom was attached to her sash behind her back along with her little pipe and tobacco pouch placed a pious offering in the tray while executing a low curtsy they were on their best behaviour throughout the visit but when the moment of departure came chrysanthème who would not go away without seeing eve asked for him with a thinly veiled persistency which was remarkable eve for whom i then sent made himself particularly charming to her so much so that this time i felt a shade of more serious annoyance i even asked myself whether the laughably pitiable ending which i had hitherto vaguely foreseen might not after all soon break upon us 
chapter forty two an oriental vision september fourth yesterday i encountered in an ancient and ruined quarter of the town a perfectly exquisite musme charmingly dressed a fresh touch of colour against the sombre background of decayed buildings i met her at the farthest end of nagasaki in the most ancient part of the town in this region are trees centuries old antique temples of buddha of amida of benten or kwanon with steep and pompous roofs monsters carved in granite sit there in courtyards silent as the grave where the grass grows between the stones this deserted quarter is traversed by a narrow torrent running in a deep channel across which are thrown little curved bridges with granite balustrades eaten away by lichen all the objects there wear the strange grimace the quaint arrangement familiar to us in the most antique japanese drawings i walked through it all at the burning hour of midday and saw not a soul unless indeed through the open windows of the bonze houses i caught sight of some few priests guardians of tombs or sanctuaries taking their siesta under dark blue gauze nets suddenly this little musme appeared a little above me just at the point of the arch of one of these bridges carpeted with grey moss she was in full sunshine and stood out in brilliant clearness like a fairy vision against the background of old black temples and deep shadows she was holding her robe together with one hand gathering it close round her ankles to give herself an air of greater slimness over her quaint little head her round umbrella with its thousand ribs threw a great halo of blue and red edged with black and an oleander tree full of flowers growing among the stones of the bridge spread its glory beside her bathed like herself in the sunshine behind this youthful figure and this flowering shrub all was blackness upon the pretty red and blue parasol great white letters formed this inscription much used among the musmes and which i have learnt to recognize stop clouds to see her pass and it was really worth the trouble to stop and look at this exquisite little person of a type so ideally japanese however it will not do to stop too long and be ensnared it would only be another delusion a doll like the rest evidently an ornament for a china shelf and nothing more while i gaze at her i say to myself that chrysanthème appearing in this same place with this dress this play of light and this aureole of sunshine would produce just as delightful an effect for chrysanthème is pretty there can be no doubt about it yesterday evening in fact i positively admired her it was quite night we were returning with the usual escort of little married couples like ourselves from the inevitable tour of the tea-houses and bazaars while the other mousmes walked along hand in hand adorned with new silver topknots which they had succeeded in having presented to them and amusing themselves with playthings she pleading fatigue followed half reclining in a gin carriage we had placed beside her great bunches of flowers destined to fill our vases late iris and long-stemmed lotus the last of the season already smelling of autumn and it was really very pretty to see this japanese girl in her little car lying carelessly among all these water flowers lighted by gleams of ever-changing colours as they chanced from the lanterns we met or passed if on the evening of my arrival in japan any one had pointed her out to me and said that shall be your musme there can not be a doubt i should have been charmed in reality however i am not charmed it is only chrysanthème always chrysanthème nothing but chrysanthème a mere plaything to laugh at a little creature of finical forms and thoughts with whom the agency of monsieur kangourou has supplied me chapter forty three the cats and the dolls the water used for drinking in our house for making tea and for lesser washing purposes is kept in large white china tubs decorated with paintings representing blue fish borne along by a swift current through distorted rushes in order to keep them cool the tubs are kept out of doors on madame prune's roof at a place where we can from the top of our projecting balcony easily reach them by stretching out an arm a real godsend for all the thirsty cats in the neighbourhood on warm summer nights is this corner of the roof with our gaily painted tubs and it proves a delightful trysting place for them after all their caterwauling and long solitary rambles on the tops of the walls 
i had thought it my duty to warn yves the first time he wished to drink this water oh he replied rather surprised cats do you say but they are not dirty on this point chrysanthème and i agree with him we do not consider cats unclean animals and we do not object to drink after them yves considers chrysanthème much in the same light she is not dirty either he says and he willingly drinks after her out of the same cup putting her in the same category with the cats these china tubs are one of the daily preoccupations of our household in the evening when we return from our walk after the clamber up which makes us thirsty and madame l'heure's waffles which we have been eating to beguile the way we always find them empty it seems impossible for madame prune or mademoiselle oyuki or their young servant mademoiselle dede dede san means miss young girl a very common name to have forethought enough to fill them while it is still daylight and when we are late in returning home these three ladies are asleep so we are obliged to attend to the business ourselves we must therefore open all the closed doors put on our boots and go down into the garden to draw water as chrysanthème would die of fright all alone in the dark in the midst of the trees and buzzing of insects i am obliged to accompany her to the well for this expedition we require a light and must seek among the quantity of lanterns purchased at madame triprocro's booth which have been thrown night after night into the bottom of one of our little paper closets but alas all the candles are burned down i thought as much well we must resolutely take the first lantern to hand and stick a fresh candle on the iron point at the bottom chrysanthème puts forth all her strength the candle splits breaks the mousme pricks her fingers pouts and whimpers such is the inevitable scene that takes place every evening and delays our retiring to rest under the dark blue gauze net for a good quarter of an hour while the cicalas on the roof seem to mock us with their ceaseless song all this which i should find amusing in any one else any one i loved irritates me in her chapter forty four tender ministrations september eleventh a week has passed very quietly during which i have written nothing by degrees i am becoming accustomed to my japanese household to the strangeness of the language costumes and faces for the last three weeks no letters have arrived from europe they have no doubt miscarried and their absence contributes as is usually the case to throw a veil of oblivion over the past every day therefore i climb up to my villa sometimes by beautiful starlit nights sometimes through downpours of rain every morning as the sound of madame prune's chanted prayer rises through the reverberating air i awake and go down toward the sea by grassy pathways full of dew the chief occupation in japan seems to be a perpetual hunt after curios we sit down on the mattings in the antique seller's little booths taking a cup of tea with the salesmen and rummage with our own hands in the cupboards and chests where many a fantastic piece of old rubbish is huddled away the bargaining much discussed is laughingly carried on for several days as if we were trying to play off some excellent little practical joke upon each other i really make a sad abuse of the adjective little i am quite aware of it but how can i do otherwise in describing this country the temptation is great to use it ten times in every written line little finical affected all japan is contained both physically and morally in these three words my purchases are accumulating in my little wood and paper house but how much more japanese it really was in its bare emptiness such as monsieur sucre and madame prune had conceived it there are now many lamps of sacred symbolism hanging from the ceiling many stools and many vases as many gods and goddesses as in a pagoda there is even a little shintoist altar before which madame prune has not been able to restrain her feelings and before which she has fallen down and chanted her prayers in her bleating goat-like voice wash me clean from all my impurity o amaterase o mi kami as one washes away uncleanness in the river of kamo alas for poor amaterase o mi kami to have to wash away the impurities of madame prune what a tedious and ungrateful task chrysanthème who is a buddhist prays sometimes in the evening before lying down although overcome with sleep she prays clapping her hands before the largest of our gilded idols 
but she smiles with a childish disrespect for her buddha as soon as her prayer is ended i know that she has also a certain veneration for her otokes the spirits of her ancestors whose rather sumptuous altar is set up at the house of her mother madame renoncule she asks for their blessings for fortune and wisdom who can fathom her ideas about the gods or about death does she possess a soul does she think she has one her religion is an obscure chaos of theogenies as old as the world treasured up out of respect for ancient customs and of more recent ideas about the blessed final annihilation imported from india by saintly chinese missionaries at the epoch of our middle ages the bonzes themselves are puzzled what a muddle therefore must not all this become when jumbled together in the childish brain of a sleepy musme two very insignificant episodes have somewhat attached me to her bonds of this kind seldom fail to draw closer in the end the first occasion was as follows madame prune one day brought forth a relic of her gay youth a tortoise-shell comb of rare transparency one of those combs that it is good style to place on the summit of the head lightly poised hardly stuck at all in the hair with all the teeth showing taking it out of a pretty little lacquered box she held it up in the air and blinked her eyes looking through it at the sky a bright summer sky as one does to examine the quality of a precious stone here is she said an object of great value that you should offer to your little wife my musme very much taken by it admired the clearness of the comb and its graceful shape the lacquered box however pleased me more on the cover was a wonderful painting in gold on gold representing a field of rice seen very close on a windy day a tangle of ears and grass beaten down and twisted by a terrible squall here and there between the distorted stalks the muddy earth of the rice swamp was visible there were even little pools of water produced by bits of the transparent lacquer on which tiny particles of gold seemed to float about like chaff in a thick liquid two or three insects which required a microscope to be well seen were clinging in a terrified manner to the rushes and the whole picture was no larger than a woman's hand as for madame prune's comb i confess it left me indifferent and i turned a deaf ear thinking it very insignificant and expensive then chrysanthem answered mournfully no thank you i don't want it take it away dear madame prune and at the same time she heaved a deep sigh full of meaning which plainly said he is not so fond of me as all that useless to bother him i immediately made the wished-for purchase later when chrysanthem will have become an old monkey like madame prune with her black teeth and long orisons she in her turn will retail that comb to some fine lady of a fresh generation on another occasion the sun had given me a headache I lay on the floor resting my head on my snakeskin pillow my eyes were dim and everything appeared to turn around the open veranda the big expanse of luminous evening sky and the variety of kites hovering against its background i felt myself vibrating painfully to the rhythmical sound of the cicalas which filled the atmosphere she crouching by my side strove to relieve me by a japanese process pressing with all her might on my temples with her little thumbs and turning them rapidly around as if she were boring a hole with a gimlet she had become quite hot and red over this hard work which procured me real comfort something similar to the dreamy intoxication of opium then anxious and fearful lest i should have an attack of fever she rolled into a pellet and thrust into my mouth a very efficacious prayer written on rice paper which she had kept carefully in the lining of one of her sleeves well i swallowed that prayer without a smile not wishing to hurt her feelings or shake her funny little faith chapter forty five two fair aristocrats today eve my musme and i went to the best photographer in nagasaki to be taken in a group we shall send the picture to france eve laughs as he thinks of his wife's astonishment when he sees chrysanthem's little face between us and he wonders how he shall explain it to her i shall just say it is one of your friends that's all he says to me in japan there are many photographers like our own with this difference that they are japanese and inhabit japanese houses 
the one we intend to honour to-day carries on his business in the suburbs in that ancient quarter of big trees and gloomy pagodas where the other day i met the pretty little musme his signboard written in several languages is posted against a wall on the edge of the little torrent which rushing down from the green mountain above is crossed by many a curved bridge of old granite and lined on either side with light bamboos or oleanders in full bloom it is astonishing and puzzling to find a photographer perched there in the very heart of old japan we have come at the wrong moment there is a file of people at the door long rows of jin's cars are stationed there awaiting the customers they have brought who will all have their turn before us the runners naked and tattooed their hair carefully combed in sleek bands and shiny chignons are chatting smoking little pipes or bathing their muscular legs in the fresh water of the torrent the courtyard is irreproachably japanese with its lanterns and dwarf trees but the studio where one poses might be in paris or pontoise the selfsame chair in old oak the same faded poofs plaster columns and pasteboard rocks the people who are being photographed at this moment are two ladies of quality evidently mother and daughter who are sitting together for a cabinet size portrait with accessories of the time of louis quinze a strange group this the first great ladies of this country i have seen so near with their long aristocratic faces dull lifeless almost grey by dint of rice powder and their mouths painted heart shape in vivid carmine with all they have an undeniable look of good breeding that strongly impresses us notwithstanding the intrinsic differences of race and acquired notions they scanned chrysanthem with a look of obvious scorn although her costume was as ladylike as their own for my part i could not take my eyes off these two creatures they captivated me like incomprehensible things that one had never seen before their fragile bodies outlandishly graceful in posture are lost in stiff materials and redundant sashes of which the ends droop like tired wings they make me think i know not why of great rare insects the extraordinary patterns on their garments have something of the dark motley of night moths above all i ponder over the mystery of their tiny slits of eyes drawn back and up so far that the tight-drawn lids can hardly open the mystery of their expression which seems to denote inner thoughts of a silly vague complacent absurdity a world of ideas absolutely closed to ourselves and i think as i gaze at them how far we are from this japanese people how totally dissimilar are our races we are compelled to let several english sailors pass before us decked out in their white drill clothes fresh fat and pink like little sugar figures who attitudinize in a sheepish manner around the shafts of the columns at last it is our turn chrysanthème settles herself slowly in a very affected style turning in the points of her toes as much as possible according to the fashion and on the negative shown to us we look like a supremely ridiculous little family drawn up in a line by a common photographer at a fair chapter forty six grave suspicions september thirteenth to-night eve is off duty three hours earlier than i occasionally this happens according to the arrangement of the watchers at those times he lands first and goes up to wait for me at du Genji from the deck i can see him through my glass climbing up the green mountain path he walks with a brisk rapid step almost running what a hurry he seems in to rejoin little chrysanthème when i arrive about nine o'clock i find him seated on the floor in the middle of my rooms with naked torso this is a sufficiently proper costume for private life here i admit around him are grouped chrysanthème oyuki and mademoiselle dede the maid all eagerly rubbing his back with little blue towels decorated with storks and humorous subjects good heavens what can he have been doing to be so hot and to have put himself in such a state he tells me that near our house a little farther up the mountain he has discovered a fencing gallery that till nightfall he had been engaged in a fencing bout against japanese who fought with two-handed swords springing like cats as is the custom of their country with his french method of fencing he had given them a good drubbing upon which with many a low bow they had shown him their admiration by bringing him a quantity of nice little iced things to drink all this combined had thrown him into a fearful perspiration ah very well nevertheless this did not quite explain to me 
he is delighted with his evening intends to go and amuse himself every day by beating them he even thinks of taking pupils once his back is dried altogether the three musmes and himself play at japanese pigeon vole really i could not wish for anything more innocent or more correct in every respect charles n and madame jonqui his wife arrive unexpectedly about ten o'clock they were wandering about in the dark shrubberies in our neighbourhood and seeing our lights came up to us they intend to finish the evening at the tea-house of the toads and they try to induce us to go and drink some iced sherbets with them it is at least an hour's walk from here on the other side of the town halfway up the hill in the gardens of the large pagoda dedicated to osueva but they stick to their idea pretending that in this clear night and bright moonlight we shall have a lovely view from the terrace of the temple lovely i have no doubt but we had intended going to bed however be it so let us go with them we hire five gins and five cars down below in the principal street in front of madame Trépropre's shop who for this late expedition chooses for us her largest round lanterns big red balloons decorated with starfish seaweed and green sharks it is nearly eleven o'clock when we make our start in the central quarters the virtuous nipponese are already closing their little booths putting out their lamps shutting the wooden framework drawing their paper panels farther on in the old-fashioned suburban streets all is shut up long ago and our carts roll on through the black night we cry out to our gins ayaku ayaku quick quick and they run as hard as they can uttering little shrieks like merry animals full of wild gaiety we rush like a whirlwind through the darkness all five in indian file dashing and jolting over the old uneven flagstones dimly lighted up by our red balloons fluttering at the end of their bamboo stems from time to time some japanese night-capped in his blue kerchief opens a window to see who these noisy madcaps can be dashing by so rapidly and so late or else some faint glimmer thrown by us on our passage discovers the hideous smile of a large stone animal seated at the gate of a pagoda at last we arrive at the foot of osueva's temple and leaving our gins with our little gigs we clamber up the gigantic steps completely deserted at this hour of the night chrysanthem who always likes to play the part of a tired little girl of a spoiled and pouting child ascends slowly between eve and myself clinging to our arms jeanqui on the contrary skips up like a bird amusing herself by counting the endless steps she lays a great stress on the accentuations as if to make the numbers sound even more droll a little silver aigrette glitters in her beautiful black coiffure her delicate and graceful figure seems strangely fantastic and the darkness that envelopes us conceals the fact that her face is quite ugly and almost without eyes this evening chrysanthem and jeanqui really look like little fairies at certain moments the most insignificant japanese have this appearance by dint of whimsical elegance and ingenious arrangement the granite stairs imposing deserted uniformly grey under the nocturnal sky appear to vanish into the empty space above us and when we turn round to disappear in the depths beneath to fall into the abyss with the dizzy rapidity of a dream on the sloping steps the black shadows of the gateways through which we must pass stretch out indefinitely and the shadows which seem to be broken at each projecting step look like the regular creases of a fan the porticos stand up separately rising one above another their wonderful shapes are at once remarkably simple and studiously affected their outlines stand out sharp and distinct having nevertheless the vague appearance of all very large objects in the pale moonlight the curved architraves rise at each extremity like two menacing horns pointing upward toward the far-off blue canopy of the star-spangled sky as if they would communicate to the gods the knowledge they have acquired in the depths of their foundations from the earth full of sepulchres and death which surrounds them we are indeed a very small group lost now in the immensity of the colossal acclivity as we move onward lighted partly by the wan moon partly by the red lanterns we hold in our hands floating at the ends of their long sticks a deep silence reigns in the precincts of the temple even the sound of insects is hushed as we ascend a sort of reverence a kind of religious fear steals over us and at the same moment a delicious coolness suddenly pervades the air and passes over us 
on entering the courtyard above we feel a little daunted here we find the horse in jade and the china turrets the enclosing walls make it the more gloomy and our arrival seems to disturb i know not what mysterious counsel held between the spirits of the air and the visible symbols that are there chimeras and monsters illuminated by the blue rays of the moon we turn to the left and go through the terraced gardens to reach the tea-house of the toads which this evening is our goal we find it shut up i expected as much closed and dark at this hour we drum all together on the door in the most coaxing tones we call by name the waiting maids we know so well mademoiselle transparente mademoiselle Etoile, mademoiselle rosé madinal and mademoiselle marguerite reine not an answer good-bye perfumed sherbets and frosted beans in front of the little archery house our mousme suddenly jump aside terrified declaring that there is a dead body on the ground yes indeed some one is lying there we cautiously examine the place by the light of our red balloons carefully held out at arm's length for fear of this dead man it is only the marksman he who on the fourth of july chose such magnificent arrows for chrysanthem and he sleeps good man with his chignon somewhat dishevelled a sound sleep which it would be cruel to disturb let us go to the end of the terrace contemplate the harbour at our feet and then return home tonight the harbour looks like only a dark and sinister rent which the moonbeams cannot fathom a yawning crevasse opening into the very bowels of the earth at the bottom of which lie faint small glimmers an assembly of glow-worms in a ditch the lights of the different vessels lying at anchor end of section six Section seven of Madame Chrysantheme by Pierre Loti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book four. Chapter forty seven. A Midnight Alarm. It is the middle of the night, perhaps about two o'clock in the morning. Our lamps are burning somewhat dimly before our placid idols. Chrysantheme wakes me suddenly, and I turn to look at her. She has raised herself on one arm, and her face expresses the most intense terror she makes a sign without daring to speak that some one or something is near creeping up to us what ill-timed visit is this a feeling of fear gains possession of me also i have a rapid impression of some great unknown danger in this isolated spot in this strange country of which i do not even yet comprehend the inhabitants and the mysteries it must be something very frightful to hold her there rooted to the spot half dead with fright she who does comprehend all these things it seems to be outside it is coming from the garden with trembling hand she indicates to me that it will come through the veranda over madame prune's roof certainly i hear faint noises and they do approach us i suggest to her nekosan it is monsieur the cats no she replies still terrified and in an alarmed tone bakemono sama it is my lords the ghosts i have already the japanese habit of expressing myself with excessive politeness no dorobo thieves thieves ah this is better i much prefer this to a visit such as i have just been dreading in the sudden awakening from sleep from ghosts or spirits of the dead thieves that is to say worthy fellows very much alive and having undoubtedly inasmuch as they are japanese thieves faces of the most meritorious oddity i am not in the least frightened now that i know precisely what to expect and we will immediately set to work to ascertain the truth for something is certainly moving on madame prune's roof someone is walking upon it i open one of our wooden panels and look out i can see only a vast expanse calm peaceful and exquisite under the full brilliance of the moonlight sleeping japan lulled by the sonorous song of the grasshoppers is charming indeed to-night and the free pure air is delicious chrysantheme half hidden behind my shoulder listens tremblingly peering forward to examine the gardens and the roofs with dilated eyes like a frightened cat no nothing not a thing moves 
here and there are a few strangely substantial shadows which at first glance were not easy to explain but which turn out to be real shadows thrown by bits of wall by boughs of trees and which preserve an extremely reassuring stillness everything seems absolutely tranquil and profound silence reigns in the dreamy vagueness which moonlight sheds over all nothing nothing to be seen anywhere it was monsieur the cats after all or perhaps my ladies the owls sounds increase in volume in the most amazing manner at night in this house of ours let us close the panel again carefully as a measure of prudence and then light a lantern and go downstairs to see whether there may be any one hidden in corners and whether the doors are tightly shut in short to reassure chrysanthème we will go the round of the house behold us then on tiptoe searching together every hole and corner of the house which to judge by its foundations must be very ancient notwithstanding the fragile appearance of its panels of white paper it contains the blackest of cavities little vaulted cellars with worm-eaten beams cupboards for rice which smell of mould and decay mysterious hollows where lies accumulated the dust of centuries in the middle of the night and during a hunt for thieves this part of the house as yet unknown to me has an ugly look noiselessly we step across the apartment of our landlord and landlady chrysanthème drags me by the hand and i allow myself to be led there they are sleeping in a row under their blue gauze tent lighted by the night lamps burning before the altars of their ancestors ha ah, i observe that they are arranged in an order which might give rise to gossip first comes mademoiselle oyuki very taking in her attitude of rest then madame prune who sleeps with her mouth wide open showing her rows of blackened teeth from her throat arises an intermittent sound like the grunting of a sow oh poor madame prune how hideous she is next monsieur sucre a mere mummy for the time being and finally at his side the last of the row is their servant mademoiselle dede the gauze hanging over them throws reflections as of the sea upon them one might suppose them victims drowned in an aquarium and with all the sacred lamps the altar crowded with strange shintoist symbols give a mock religious air to this family tableau on y soit qui mal y pense but why is not that maid-servant rather laid by the side of her mistresses now when we on the floor above offer our hospitality to eve we are careful to place ourselves under our mosquito net in a more correct style one corner which as a last resort we inspect inspires me with a certain amount of apprehension it is a low mysterious loft against the door of which is stuck as a thing no longer wanted a very old pious image quanon with the thousand arms and quanon with the horse's head seated among clouds and flames both horrible to behold with their spectral grins we open the door and chrysanthème starts back uttering a fearful cry i should have thought the robbers were there had i not seen a little grey creature rapid and noiseless rush by her and disappear a young rat that had been eating rice on the top of a shelf and in its alarm had dashed in her face chapter forty eight unusual hospitality september sixteenth eve has let fall his silver whistle in the ocean the whistle so absolutely indispensable for the manoeuvres and we search the town all day long followed by chrysanthème and mademoiselle la neige and la lune her sisters in an endeavour to find another it is however very difficult to find such a thing in nagasaki above all very difficult to explain in japanese what is a sailor's whistle of the traditional shape curved and with a little ball at the end to modulate the trills and the various sounds of official orders for three hours we are sent from shop to shop at each one they pretend to understand perfectly what is wanted and trace on tissue paper with a paintbrush the addresses of the shops where we shall without fail meet with what we require away we go full of hope only to encounter some fresh mystification till our breathless gins get quite bewildered they understand admirably that we want a thing that will make a noise music in short thereupon they offer us instruments of every and of the most unexpected shape squeakers for punch and judy voices dog whistles trumpets 
each time it is something more and more absurd so that at last we are overcome with uncontrollable fits of laughter last of all an aged japanese optician who assumes a most knowing air a look of sublime wisdom goes off to forage in his back shop and brings to light a steam foghorn a relict from some wrecked steamer after dinner the chief event of the evening is a deluge of rain which takes us by surprise as we leave the tea-houses on our return from our fashionable stroll it so happened that we were a large party having with us several mousme guests and from the moment that the rain began to fall from the skies as if out of a watering pot turned upside down the band became disorganized the mousmes run off with bird-like cries and take refuge under doorways in the shops under the hoods of the gins then before long when the shops shut up in haste when the emptied streets are flooded and almost black and the paper lanterns piteous objects wet through and extinguished i find myself i know not how it happens flattened against a wall under the projecting eaves alone in the company of mademoiselle fraise my cousin who is crying bitterly because her fine robe is wet through and in the noise of the rain which is still falling and splashing everything with the spouts and gutters which in the darkness plaintively murmur like running streams the town appears to me suddenly an abode of the gloomiest sadness the shower is soon over and the mousmes come out of their holes like so many mice they look for one another call one another and their little voices take the singular melancholy dragging inflections they assume whenever they have to call from afar hi mademoiselle lune hi madame jonqui they shout from one to another their outlandish names prolonging them indefinitely in the now silent night in the reverberations of the damp air after the great summer rain at length they are all collected and united again these tiny personages with narrow eyes and no brains and we return to jujenji all wet through for the third time we have eve sleeping beside us under our blue tent there is a great noise shortly after midnight in the apartment beneath us our landlord's family have returned from a pilgrimage to a far distant temple of the goddess of grace although madame prune is a shintoist she reveres this deity who scandal says watched over her youth a moment after mademoiselle oyuki bursts into our room like a rocket bringing on a charming little tray sweetmeats which have been blessed and bought at the gates of the temple yonder on purpose for us and which we must positively eat at once before the virtue is gone out of them hardly rousing ourselves we absorb these little edibles flavoured with sugar and pepper and return a great many sleepy thanks eve sleeps quietly on this occasion without dealing any blows to the floor or the panels with either fists or feet he has hung his watch on one of the hands of our gilded idol in order to be more sure of seeing the hour at any time of the night by the light of the sacred lamps he gets up betimes in the morning asking well did i behave properly and dresses in haste preoccupied about duty and the roll call outside no doubt it is daylight already through the tiny holes which time has pierced in our wooden panels threads of morning light penetrate our chamber and in the atmosphere of our room where night still lingers they trace vague white rays soon when the sun shall have risen these rays will lengthen and become beautifully golden the cocks and the cicalas make themselves heard and now madame prune will begin her mystic drone nevertheless out of politeness for eve's son chrysanthem lights a lantern and escorts him to the foot of the dark staircase i even fancy that on parting i hear a kiss exchanged in japan this is of no consequence i know it is very usual and quite admissible no matter where one goes in houses one enters for the first time one is quite at liberty to kiss any mousme who may be present without any notice being taken of it but with regard to chrysanthem eve is in a delicate position and he ought to understand it better i begin to feel uneasy about the hours they have so often spent together alone and i make up my mind that this very day i will not play the spy upon them but speak frankly to eve and make a clean breast of it suddenly from below clack clack two dry hands are clapped together it is madame prune's warning to the great spirit and immediately after her prayer breaks forth soars upward in a shrill nasal falsetto like a morning alarum when the hour for waking has come the mechanical noise of a spring let go and running down 
the richest woman in the world cleansed from all my sins o amaterase o mi kami in the river of kamo and this extraordinary bleating hardly human scatters and changes my ideas which were very nearly clear at the moment i awoke chapter forty nine rumours of departure september fifteenth rumour of departure is in the air since yesterday there has been vague talk of our being sent to china to the gulf of pekin one of those rumours which spread no one knows how from one end of the ship to the other two or three days before the official orders arrive and which usually turn out tolerably correct what will the last act of my little japanese comedy be the denouement the separation will there be any touch of sadness on the part of my musme or on my own just a tightening of the heartstrings at the moment of our final farewell at this moment i can imagine nothing of the sort and then the adieus of eve and chrysanthème what will they be this question preoccupies me more than all nothing very definite has been learned as yet but it is certain that one way or another our stay in japan is drawing to a close it is this perhaps which disposes me this evening to look more kindly on my surroundings it is about six o'clock after a day spent on duty when i reach Dujenji. the evening sun low in the sky on the point of setting pours into my room and floods it with rays of red gold lighting up the buddhas and the great sheaves of quaintly arranged flowers in the antique vases here are assembled five or six little dolls my neighbours amusing themselves by dancing to the sound of chrysanthem's guitar and this evening i experienced a real charm in feeling that this dwelling and the woman who leads the dance are mine on the whole i have perhaps been unjust to this country it seems to me that my eyes are at last opened to see it in its true light that all my senses are undergoing a strange and abrupt transition i suddenly have a better perception and appreciation of all the infinity of dainty trifles among which i live of the fragile and studied grace of their forms the oddity of their drawings the refined choice of their colours i stretch myself upon the white mats chrysanthème always eagerly attentive brings me my pillow of serpent's skin and the smiling mousmes with the interrupted rhythm of a while ago still running in their heads move around me with measured steps their immaculate socks with the separate great toes make no noise nothing is heard as they glide by but a frou-frou of silken stuffs i find them all pleasant to look upon their dollish air pleases me now and i fancy i have discovered what it is that gives it to them it is not only their round inexpressive faces with eyebrows far removed from the eyelids but the excessive amplitude of their dress with those huge sleeves it might be supposed that they have neither back nor shoulders their delicate figures are lost in these wide robes which float around what might be little marionettes without bodies at all and which would slip to the ground of themselves were they not kept together midway about where a waist should be by the wide silken sashes a very different comprehension of the art of dressing to ours which endeavours as much as possible to bring into relief the curves real or false of the figure and then how much i admire the flowers in our vases arranged by chrysanthème with her japanese taste lotus flowers great sacred flowers of a tender veined rose colour the milky rose tint seen on porcelain they resemble when in full bloom great water lilies and when only in bud might be taken for long pale tulips their soft but rather cloying scent is added to that other indefinable odour of mousmes of yellow race of japan which is always and everywhere in the air the late flowers of september at this season very rare and expensive grow on longer stems than the summer blooms chrysanthème has left them in their large aquatic leaves of a melancholy seaweed green and mingled with them tall slight rushes i look at them and recall with some irony those great round bunches in the shape of cauliflowers which our florists sell in france wrapped in white lace paper still no letters from europe from any one how things change become effaced and forgotten here am i accommodating myself to this finical japan and dwindling down to its affected mannerism i feel that my thoughts run in smaller grooves my tastes incline to smaller things things which suggest nothing greater than a smile i am becoming used to tiny and ingenious furniture to doll-like desks 
to miniature bowls with which to play at dinner to the immaculate monotony of the mats to the finely finished simplicity of the white woodwork i am even losing my western prejudices all my preconceived ideas are this evening evaporating and vanishing crossing the garden i have courteously saluted monsieur sucre who was watering his dwarf shrubs and his deformed flowers and madame prune appears to me a highly respectable old lady in whose past there is nothing to criticize we shall take no walk to-night my only wish is to remain stretched out where i am listening to the music of my mousme's chamison till now i have always used the word guitar to avoid exotic terms for the abuse of which i have been so reproached but neither the word guitar nor mandolin suffices to designate this slender instrument with its long neck the high notes of which are shriller than the voice of the grasshopper and henceforth i will write chamison i will also call my musme kiku kikusan this name suits her better than chrysanthem which though translating the sense exactly does not preserve the strange sounding euphony of the original i therefore say to kiku my wife play play on for me i shall remain here all the evening and listen to you astonished to find me in so amiable a mood she requires pressing a little and with almost a bitter curve of triumph and disdain upon her lips she seats herself in the attitude of an idol raises her long dark-coloured sleeves and begins the first hesitating notes are murmured faintly and mingle with the music of the insects humming outside in the quiet air of the warm and golden twilight first she plays slowly a confused medley of fragments which she does not seem to remember perfectly of which one waits for the finish and waits in vain while the other girls giggle inattentive and regretful of their interrupted dance she herself is absent sulky as if she were only performing a duty then by degrees little by little the music becomes more animated and the mousmes begin to listen now tremblingly it grows into a feverish rapidity and her gaze has no longer the vacant stare of a doll then the music changes again in it there is the sighing of the wind the hideous laughter of ghouls tears heart-rending plaints and her dilated pupils seem to be directed inwardly in settled gaze on some indescribable japaneserie within her own soul i listen lying there with eyes half shut looking out between my drooping eyelids which are gradually lowering in involuntary heaviness upon the enormous red sun dying away over nagasaki i have a somewhat melancholy feeling that my past life and all other places in the world are receding from my view and fading away at this moment of nightfall i feel almost at home in this corner of japan amidst the gardens of this suburb i have never had such an impression before chapter fifty a doll's duet september sixteenth seven o'clock in the evening we shall not go down into nagasaki tonight but like good japanese citizens remain in our lofty suburb in undress uniform we shall go eve and i in a neighbourly way as far as the fencing gallery which is only two steps away just above our villa and almost abutting on our fresh and scented garden the gallery is closed already and a little musko seated at the door explains with many low bows that we come too late all the amateurs are gone we must come again to-morrow the evening is so mild and fine that we remain out of doors following without any definite purpose the pathway which rises even higher and higher and loses itself at length in the solitary regions of the mountain among the upper peaks for an hour at least we wander on an unintended walk and finally find ourselves at a great height commanding an endless perspective lighted by the last gleams of daylight we are in a desolate and mournful spot in the midst of the little buddhist cemeteries which are scattered over the country in every direction we meet a few belated labourers who are returning from the fields with bundles of tea upon their shoulders these peasants have a half savage air they are half naked too or clothed only in long robes of blue cotton as they pass they salute us with humble bows no trees in this elevated region fields of tea alternate with tombs old granite statues which represent buddha in his lotus or else old monumental stones on which gleam remains of inscriptions in golden letters 
rocks brushwood uncultivated spaces surround us on all sides we meet no more passers-by and the light is failing we will halt for a moment and then it will be time to turn our steps homeward but close to the spot where we stand a box of white wood provided with handles a sort of sedan chair rests on the freshly disturbed earth with its lotus of silvered paper and the little incense sticks burning yet by its side clearly someone has been buried here this very evening i cannot picture this personage to myself the japanese are so grotesque in life that it is almost impossible to imagine them in the calm majesty of death nevertheless let us move farther on we might disturb him he is too recently dead his presence unnerves us we will go and seat ourselves on one of these other tombs so unutterably ancient that there can no longer be anything within it but dust and there seated in the dying sunlight while the valleys and plains of the earth below are already lost in shadow we will talk together i wish to speak to eve about chrysanthem it is indeed somewhat in view of this that i have persuaded him to sit down but how to set about it without hurting his feelings and without making myself ridiculous i hardly know however the pure air playing round me up here and the magnificent landscape spread beneath my feet impart a certain serenity to my thoughts which makes me feel a contemptuous pity both for my suspicions and the cause of them we speak first of all of the order for departure which may arrive at any moment for china or for france soon we shall have to leave this easy and almost amusing life this japanese suburb where chance has installed us and our little house buried among flowers eve perhaps will regret all this more than i i know that well enough for it is the first time that any such interlude has broken the rude monotony of his hard-worked career formerly when in an inferior rank he was hardly more often on shore in foreign countries than the seagulls themselves while i from the very beginning have been spoiled by residence in all sorts of charming spots infinitely superior to this in all sorts of countries and the remembrance still haunts me pleasurably in order to discover how the land lies i risk the remark you will perhaps be more sorry to leave little chrysanthem than i silence reigns between us after which i go on and burning my ships i add you know after all if you have such a fancy for her i haven't really married her one can't really consider her my wife in great surprise he looks in my face not your wife you say but by jove though that's just it she is your wife there is no need of many words at any time between us two i know exactly now by his tone by his great good-humoured smile how the case stands i understand all that lies in the little phrase that's just it she is your wife if she were not well then he could not answer for what might happen notwithstanding any remorse he might have in the depths of his heart since he is no longer a bachelor and free as air as in former days but he considers her my wife and she is sacred i have the fullest faith in his word and i experience a positive relief a real joy at finding my stanch eve of bygone days how could i have so succumbed to the demeaning influence of my surroundings as to suspect him even and to invent for myself such a mean petty anxiety we shall never even mention that doll again we remain up there very late talking of other things gazing at the immense depths below at the valleys and mountains as they become one by one indistinct and lost in the deepening darkness placed as we are at an enormous height in the wide free atmosphere we seem already to have quitted this miniature country already to be freed from the impression of littleness which it has given us and from the little links by which it was beginning to bind us to itself seen from such heights as these all the countries of the globe bear a strong resemblance to one another they lose the imprint made upon them by man and by races by all the atoms swarming on the surface as of old in the breton marshes in the woods of tourven or at sea in the night watches we talk of all those things to which thoughts naturally revert in darkness of ghosts of spirits of eternity of the great hereafter of chaos and we entirely forget little chrysanthème when we arrive at ju genji in the starry night the music of her shamisen heard from afar recalls to us her existence 
she is studying some vocal duet with mademoiselle oyuki her pupil i feel myself in very good humour this evening and relieved from my absurd suspicions about my poor eve am quite disposed to enjoy without reserve my last days in japan and to derive therefrom all the amusement possible let us then repose ourselves on the dazzling white mats and listen to the singular duet sung by those two musmes a strange musical medley slow and mournful beginning with two or three high notes and descending at each couplet in an almost imperceptible manner into actual solemnity the song keeps its dragging slowness but the accompaniment becoming more and more accentuated is like the impetuous sound of a far-off hurricane at the end when these girlish voices usually so soft give out their hoarse and guttural notes chrysanthem's hands fly wildly and convulsively over the quivering strings both of them lower their heads pout their underlips in the effort to bring out these astonishingly deep notes and at these moments their little narrow eyes open and seem to reveal an unexpected something almost a soul under these trappings of marionettes but it is a soul which more than ever appears to me of a different species from my own i feel my thoughts to be as far removed from theirs as from the flitting conceptions of a bird or the dreams of a monkey i feel there is between them and myself a great gulf mysterious and awful other sounds of music wafted to us from the distance interrupt for a moment those of our musmes from the depths below in nagasaki arises a sudden noise of gongs and guitars we rush to the balcony of the veranda to hear it better it is a matsuri a fete a procession passing through the quarter which is not so virtuous as our own so our musmes tell us with a disdainful toss of the head nevertheless from the heights on which we dwell seen thus in a bird's eye view by the uncertain light of the stars this district has a singularly chaste air and the concert going on therein purified in its ascent from the depths of the abyss to our lofty altitudes reaches us confusedly a smothered enchanted enchanting sound then it diminishes and dies away into silence the two little friends return to their seats on the mats and once more take up their melancholy duet an orchestra discreetly subdued but innumerable of crickets and cicalas accompanies them in an unceasing tremolo the immense far-reaching tremolo which gentle and eternal never ceases in japan end of section seven Section 8 of Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Loti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 4. Chapter 51. The Last Day. September 17th. At the hour of siesta, a peremptory order arrives to start tomorrow for China, for Che Fu, the terrible place in the Gulf of Pekin. Eve comes to wake me in my cabin to bring me the news i must positively get leave to go on shore this evening he says while i endeavour to shake myself awake if it is only to help you to dismantle and pack up he gazes through my porthole raising his glance toward the green summits in the direction of du genji and our echoing old cottage hidden from us by a turn of the mountain it is very nice of him to wish to help me in my packing but i think he counts also upon saying farewell to his little japanese friends up there and i really cannot find fault with that he finishes his work and does in fact obtain leave without help from me to go on shore at five o'clock after drill and manoeuvres as for myself i start at once in a hired sampan in the vast flood of midday sunshine to the quivering noise of the cicalas i mount to jujenji the paths are solitary the plants are drooping in the heat here however is madame jonquille taking the air in the bright grasshopper's sunshine sheltering her dainty figure and her charming face under an enormous paper parasol a huge circle closely ribbed and fantastically striped she recognizes me from afar and laughing as usual runs to meet me i announce our departure and a tearful pout suddenly contracts her childish face after all does this news grieve her is she about to shed tears over it no it turns to a fit of laughter 
a little nervous perhaps but unexpected and disconcerting dry and clear peeling through the silence and warmth of the narrow paths like a cascade of little mock pearls ah there indeed is a marriage tie which will be broken without much pain but she fills me with impatience poor empty-headed linnet with her laughter and i turn my back upon her to continue my journey above stairs chrysanthème sleeps stretched out on the floor the house is wide open and the soft mountain breeze rustles gently through it that same evening we had intended to give a tea party and by my orders flowers had already been placed in every nook and corner of the house there were lotus in our vases beautifully coloured lotus the last of the season i verily believe they must have been ordered from a special gardener out yonder near the great temple and they will cost me dear with a few gentle taps of a fan i awake my surprised musme and curious to catch her first impressions i announce my departure she starts up rubs her eyelids with the backs of her little hands looks at me and hangs her head something like an expression of sadness passes in her eyes this little sinking at the heart is for eve no doubt the news spreads through the house mademoiselle oyuki dashes upstairs with half a tear in each of her babyish eyes kisses me with her full red lips which always leave a wet ring on my cheek then quickly draws from her wide sleeve a square of tissue paper wipes away her stealthy tears blows her little nose rolls the bit of paper in a ball and throws it into the street on the parasol of a passer-by then madame prune makes her appearance in an agitated and discomposed manner she successively adopts every attitude expressive of dismay what on earth is the matter with the old lady and why does she keep getting closer and closer to me till she is almost in my way it is wonderful to think of all that i still have to do this last day and the endless drives i have to make to the old curiosity shops to my tradespeople and to the packers nevertheless before my rooms are dismantled i intend making a sketch of them as i did formerly at stamboul it really seems to me as if all i do here is a bitter parody of all i did over there this time however it is not that i care for this dwelling it is only because it is pretty and uncommon and the sketch will be an interesting souvenir i fetch therefore a leaf out of my album and begin at once seated on the floor and leaning on my desk ornamented with grasshoppers in relief while behind me very very close to me the three women follow the movements of my pencil with astonished attention japanese art being entirely conventional they have never before seen any one draw from nature and my style delights them i may not perhaps possess the steady and nimble touch of monsieur sucre as he groups his charming stalks but i am master of a few motions of perspective which are wanting in him and i have been taught to draw things as i see them without giving them an ingeniously distorted and grimacing attitude and the three japanese are amazed at the air of reality displayed in my sketch with little shrieks of admiration they point out to one another the different things as little by little their shape and form are outlined in black on my paper chrysanthème gazes at me with a new kind of interest anata ichiban she says literally thou first meaning you are really quite wonderful mademoiselle oyuki is carried away by her admiration and exclaims in a burst of enthusiasm anata bakari thou alone that is to say there is no one like you in all the world all the rest are mere rubbish madame prune says nothing but i can see that she does not think the less her languishing attitudes her hand that at each moment gently touches mine confirm the suspicions that her look of dismay a few moments ago awoke within me evidently my physical charms speak to her imagination which in spite of years has remained full of romance i shall leave with the regret of having understood her too late although the ladies are satisfied with my sketch i am far from being so i have put everything in its place most exactly but as a whole it has an ordinary indifferent french look which does not suit the sentiment is not given and i almost wonder whether i should not have done better to falsify the perspective japanese style exaggerating to the very utmost the already abnormal outlines of what i see before me and then the pictured dwelling lacks the fragile look and its sonority that reminds one of a dry violin in the penciled delineation of the woodwork 
the minute delicacy with which it is wrought is wanting neither have i been able to give an idea of the extreme antiquity the perfect cleanliness nor the vibrating song of the cicalas that seems to have been stored away within it in its parched up fibres during hundreds of summers it does not convey either the impression this place gives of being in a far-off suburb perched aloft among trees above the drollest of towns no all this cannot be drawn cannot be expressed but remains undemonstrable indefinable having sent out our invitations we shall in spite of everything give our tea-party this evening a parting tea therefore in which we shall display as much pomp as possible it is moreover rather my custom to wind up my exotic experiences with a fete in other countries i have done the same besides our usual set we shall have my mother-in-law my relatives and all the mousmes of the neighbourhood but by an extra japanese refinement we shall not admit a single european friend not even the amazingly tall one eve alone shall be admitted and even he shall be hidden away in a corner behind some flowers and works of art in the last glimmer of twilight by the light of the first twinkling star the ladies with many charming curtsies make their appearance our house is soon full of the little crouching women with their tiny slit eyes vaguely smiling their beautifully dressed hair shining like polished ebony their fragile bodies lost in the many folds of the exaggerated wide garments that gape as if ready to drop from their little tapering backs and reveal the exquisite napes of their little necks chrysanthème with somewhat a melancholy air and my mother-in-law madame renoncule with many affected graces busy themselves in the midst of the different groups where ere long the miniature pipes are lighted soon there arises a murmuring sound of discreet laughter expressing nothing but having a pretty exotic ring about it and then begins a harmony of tap 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 sharp rapid taps against the edges of the finely lacquered smoking boxes pickled and spiced fruits are handed round on trays of quaint and varied shapes then transparent china teacups no larger than half an eggshell make their appearance and the ladies are offered a few drops of sugarless tea poured out of toy kettles or a sip of sake a spirit made from rice which it is the custom to serve hot in elegantly shaped vases long-necked like a heron's throat several mousmes execute one after another improvisations on the chamison others sing in sharp high voices hopping about continually like cicalas in delirium madame prune no longer able to make a mystery of the long pent-up feelings that agitate her pays me the most marked and tender attentions and begs my acceptance of a quantity of little souvenirs an image a little vase a little porcelain goddess of the moon in satsuma ware a marvellously grotesque ivory figure i tremblingly follow her into the dark corners whither she calls me to give me these presents in tete a tete about nine o'clock with a silken rustling arrive the three geishas in vogue in nagasaki mademoiselle pureté orange and printemps whom i have hired at four dollars each an enormous price in this country these three geishas are indeed the very same little creatures i heard singing on the rainy day of my arrival through the thin panelling of the garden of flowers but as i have now become thoroughly japanized today they appear to me more diminutive less outlandish and in no way mysterious i treat them rather as dancers that i have hired and the idea that i ever had thought of marrying one of them now makes me shrug my shoulders as it formerly made monsieur kangourou the excessive heat caused by the respiration of the mousmes and the burning lamps brings out the perfume of the lotus which fills the heavy laden atmosphere and the scent of camellia oil which the ladies use in profusion to make their hair glisten is also strong in the room mademoiselle orange the youngest geisha tiny and dainty her lips outlined with gilt paint executes some delightful steps donning the most extraordinary wigs and masks of wood or cardboard she has masks imitating old noble ladies which are valuable works of art signed by well-known artists she has also magnificent long robes fashioned in the old style with trains trimmed at the bottom with thick pads in order to give to the movements of the costume something rigid and unnatural which however is becoming now the soft balmy breezes blow through the room from one veranda to the other making the flames of the lamps flicker they scatter the lotus flowers faded by the artificial heat 
which falling in pieces from every vase sprinkle the guests with their pollen and large pink petals looking like bits of broken opal-coloured glass the sensational piece reserved for the end is a trio on the chamecen long and monotonous that the geishas perform as a rapid pizzicato on the highest strings very sharply struck it sounds like the very quintessence the paraphrase the exasperation if i may so call it of the eternal buzz of insects which issues from the trees old roofs old walls from everything in fact and which is the foundation of all japanese sounds half past ten the programme has been carried out and the reception is over a last general tap 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 the little pipes are stowed away in their chaste sheaths tied up in the sashes and the mousmes rise to depart they light at the end of short sticks a quantity of red grey or blue lanterns and after a series of endless bows and curtsies the guests disperse in the darkness of the lanes and trees we also go down to the town eve chrysanthem or yuki and i in order to conduct my mother-in-law sisters-in-law and my youthful aunt madame nenufar to their house we wish to take one last stroll together in our old familiar pleasure haunts to drink one more iced sherbet at the house of the indescribable butterflies buy one more lantern at madame Trépropre's, and eat some parting waffles at madame leur's i try to be affected moved by this leave-taking but without success in regard to japan as with the little men and women who inhabit it there is something decidedly wanting pleasant enough as a mere pastime it begets no feeling of attachment on our return when i am once more with eve and the two musmes climbing up the road to jujenji which i shall probably never see again a vague feeling of melancholy pervades my last stroll it is however but the melancholy inseparable from all things that are about to end without possibility of return moreover this calm and splendid summer is also drawing to a close for us since to-morrow we shall go forth to meet the autumn in northern china i am beginning alas to count the youthful summers i may still hope for i feel more gloomy each time another fades away and flies to rejoin the others already disappeared in the dark and bottomless abyss where all past things lie buried at midnight we return home and my removal begins while on board the amazingly tall friend kindly takes my watch it is a nocturnal rapid stealthy removal doyobo thieves fashion remarks eve who in visiting the mousmes has picked up a smattering of the nipponese language messieurs the packers have at my request sent in the evening several charming little boxes with compartments and false bottoms and several paper bags in the unterrible japanese paper which close of themselves and are fastened by strings also in paper arranged beforehand in the most ingenious manner quite the cleverest and most handy thing of its kind for little useful trifles these people are unrivalled it is a real treat to pack them and everybody lends a helping hand eve chrysanthem madame prune her daughter and monsieur sucre by the glimmer of the reception lamps which are still burning every one wraps rolls and ties up expeditiously for it is already late although uyuki has a heavy heart she cannot prevent herself from indulging in a few bursts of childish laughter while she works madame prune bathed in tears no longer restrains her feelings poor old lady i really very much regret chrysanthem is absent-minded and silent but what a fearful amount of luggage eighteen cases or parcels containing buddhas chimeras and vases without mentioning the last lotus that i carry away tied up in a pink cluster all this is piled up in the gins carts hired at sunset which are waiting at the door while their runners lie asleep on the grass a starlit and exquisite night we start off with lighted lanterns followed by the three sorrowful ladies who accompany us and by abrupt slopes dangerous in the darkness we descend toward the sea the jins stiffening their muscular legs hold back with all their might the heavily loaded little cars which would run down by themselves if left alone and that so rapidly that they would rush into empty space with my most valuable chattels chrysanthem walks by my side and expresses in a soft and winning manner her regret that the wonderfully tall friend did not offer to replace me for the whole of my night watch as that would have allowed me to spend this last night 
even till morning under our roof listen she says come back to-morrow in the daytime before getting under way to bid one good-bye i shall not return to my mother until evening you will find me still up there and i promise they stop at a certain turn whence we have a bird's-eye view of the whole harbour the black stagnant waters reflect innumerable distant fires and the ships tiny immovable objects which seen from our point of view take the shape of fish seem also to slumber little objects which serve to bear us elsewhere to go far away and to forget the three ladies are about to turn back home for the night is already far advanced and farther down the cosmopolitan quarters near the quays are not safe at this unusual hour the moment has therefore come for eve who will not land again to make his last tragic farewells to his friends the little mousmes i am very curious to see the parting between eve and chrysantheme i listen with all my ears i look with all my eyes but it takes place in the simplest and quietest fashion none of that heart-breaking which will be inevitable between madame prune and myself i even notice in my mousme an indifference an unconcern which puzzles me i positively am at a loss to understand what it all means and i muse as i continue to descend toward the sea her appearance of sadness was not therefore on eve's account on whose then and the phrase runs through my head come back to-morrow before setting sail to bid me good-bye i shall not return to my mother until evening you will find me still up there japan is indeed most delightful this evening so fresh and so sweet and little chrysantheme was very charming just now as she silently walked beside me through the darkness of the lane it is about two o'clock when we reach the triomphante in a hired sampan where i have heaped up all my cases till there is danger of sinking the very tall friend gives over to me the watch that i must keep till four o'clock and the sailors on duty but half awake make a chain in the darkness to haul on board all my fragile luggage chapter fifty two farewell september eighteenth i intended to sleep late this morning in order to make up for my lost sleep of last night but at eight o'clock three persons of the most extraordinary appearance led by m kangourou present themselves with profound bows at the door of my cabin they are arrayed in long robes bedizened with dark patterns they have the flowing locks high foreheads and pallid countenances of persons too exclusively devoted to the fine arts and perched on the top of their coiffures they wear sailor hats of english shape tipped jauntily on one side tucked under their arms they carry portfolios filled with sketches in their hands are boxes of water-colours pencils and bounded together like faces a bundle of fine stylets with the sharp and glittering points at the first glance even in the bewilderment of waking up i gather from their appearance what their errand is and guessing with what visitors i have to deal i say come in messieurs the tattooers these are the specialists most in renown in nagasaki i had engaged them two days ago not knowing that we were about to leave and since they are here i will not turn them away my friendly and intimate relations with primitive man in oceania and elsewhere have imbued me with a deplorable taste for tattoo work and i had wished to carry away on my own person as a curiosity an ornament a specimen of the work of the japanese tattooers who have a delicacy of finish which is unequalled from their albums spread out upon my table i make my choice there are some remarkably odd designs among them appropriate to the different parts of the human body emblems for the arms and legs sprays of roses for the shoulders great grinning faces for the middle of the back there are even to suit the taste of their clients who belong to foreign navies trophies of arms american and french flags entwined a god save the queen amid encircling stars and figures of women taken from gravin sketches in the journal amusant my choice rests upon a singular blue and pink dragon two inches long which will have a fine effect upon my chest on the side opposite the heart then follows an hour and a half of irritation and positive pain stretched out on my bunk and delivered over to the tender mercies of these personages i stiffen myself and submit to the million imperceptible pricks they inflict when by chance a little blood flows confusing the outline by a stream of red one of the artists hastens to stanch it with his lips and i make no objections knowing that this is the japanese manner 
the method used by their doctors for the wounds of both man and beast a piece of work as minute and fine as that of an engraver upon stone is slowly executed on my person and their lean hands harrow and worry me with automatic precision finally it is finished and the tattooers falling back with an air of satisfaction to contemplate their work declare it to be lovely i dress myself quickly to go on shore to take advantage of my last hours in japan the heat is fearful to-day the powerful september sun falls with a certain melancholy upon the yellowing leaves it is a day of clear burning heat after an almost chilly morning as i did yesterday i ascend to my lofty suburb during the drowsy noontime by deserted pathways filled only with light and silence i noiselessly open the door of my dwelling and enter cautiously on tiptoe for fear of madame prune at the foot of the staircase upon the white mats beside the little sabots and tiny sandals which are always lying about in the vestibule a great array of luggage is ready for departure which i recognize at a glance pretty dark robes familiar to my sight carefully folded and wrapped in blue towels tied at the four corners i even fancy i feel a little sad when i catch sight of a corner of the famous box of letters and souvenirs peeping out of one of these bundles in which my portrait by urena now reposes among diverse photographs of mousmes a sort of long-necked mandolin also ready for departure lies on the top of the pile in its case of figured silk it resembles the flitting of some gypsy or rather it reminds me of an engraving in a book of fables i owned in my childhood the whole thing is exactly like the slender wardrobe and the long guitar which the cicala who had sung all the summer carried upon her back when she knocked at the door of her neighbour the ant poor little gypsy i mount the steps on tiptoe and stop at the sound of singing that i hear in my room it is undoubtedly chrysanthem's voice and the song is quite cheerful this chills me and changes the current of my thoughts i am almost sorry i have taken the trouble to come mingled with the song is a noise i cannot understand chink chink a clear metallic ring as of coins flung vigorously on the floor i am well aware that this vibrating house exaggerates every sound during the silence of night but all the same i am puzzled to know what my musme can be doing chink chink is she amusing herself with coits or the jeu de crapaud or pitch and toss nothing of the kind i fancy i have guessed and i continue my upward progress still more gently on all fours with the precautions of a red indian to give myself for the last time the pleasure of surprising her she has not heard me come in in our great white room emptied and swept out where the clear sunshine pours in and the soft wind and the yellowed leaves of the garden she is sitting all alone her back turned to the door she is dressed for walking ready to go to her mother's her rose-coloured parasol beside her on the floor are spread out all the fine silver dollars which according to our agreement i had given her the evening before with the competent dexterity of an old money-changer she fingers them turns them over throws them on the floor and armed with a little mallet ad hoc rings them vigorously against her ear singing the while i know not what little pensive bird-like song which i dare say she improvises as she goes along well after all it is even more completely japanese than i could possibly have imagined it this last scene of my married life i feel inclined to laugh how simple i have been to allow myself to be taken in by the few clever words she whispered yesterday as she walked beside me by a tolerably pretty little phrase embellished as it was by the silence of two o'clock in the morning and all the wonderful enchantments of night ah not more for eve than for me not more for me than for eve has any feeling passed through that little brain that little heart when i have looked at her long enough i call ay chrysanthème she turns confused and reddening even to her ears at having been caught at this work she is quite wrong however to be so much troubled for i am on the contrary delighted the fear that i might be leaving her in some sadness had almost given me a pang and i infinitely prefer that this marriage should end as it had begun in a joke that is a good idea of yours i say a precaution which should always be taken in this country of yours where so many evil-minded people are clever in forging money 
make haste and get through it before i start and if any false pieces have found their way into the number i will willingly replace them however she refuses to continue before me and i expected as much to do so would have been contrary to all her notions of politeness hereditary and acquired all her conventionality all her japaneserie with a disdainful little foot clothed as usual in exquisite socks with a special hood for the great toe she pushes away the piles of white dollars and scatters them on the mats we have hired a large covered sampan she says to change the conversation and we were all going together campanule jonquille touki all your mousmes to watch your vessel set sail pray sit down and stay a few minutes no i really cannot stay i have several things to do in the town you see and the order was given for every one to be on board by three o'clock in time for muster before starting moreover i would prefer to escape as you can imagine while madame prune is still enjoying her siesta i should be afraid of being drawn into some corner or of provoking some heart-rending parting scene chrysantheme bows her head and says no more but seeing that i am really going rises to escort me without speaking without the slightest noise she follows me as we descend the staircase and cross the garden full of sunshine where the dwarf shrubs and the deformed flowers seem like the rest of the household plunged in warm somnolence at the outer gate i stop for the last adieu the little sad pout has reappeared more accentuated than ever on chrysantheme's face it is the right thing it is correct and i should feel offended now were it absent well little mousme let us part good friends one last kiss even if you like i took you to amuse me you have not perhaps succeeded very well but after all you have done what you could given me your little face your little curtsies your little music in short you have been pleasant enough in your japanese way and who knows perchance i may yet think of you sometimes when i recall this glorious summer these pretty quaint gardens and the ceaseless concert of the cicalas she prostrates herself on the threshold of the door her forehead against the ground and remains in this attitude of superlatively polite salute as long as i am in sight while i go down the pathway by which i am to disappear for ever as the distance between us increases i turn once or twice to look at her again but it is a mere civility and meant to return as it deserves her grand final salutation chapter fifty three off for china when i entered the town at the turn of the principal street i had the good luck to meet number four hundred and fifteen my poor relative i was just at that moment in want of a speedy gin and i at once got into his vehicle besides it was an alleviation to my feelings in this hour of departure to take my last drive in company with a member of my family unaccustomed as i was to be out of doors during the hours of siesta i had never yet seen the streets of the town thus overwhelmed by the sunshine thus deserted in the silence and solitary brilliancy peculiar to all hot countries in front of all the shops hang white shades adorned here and there with slight designs in black in the quaintness of which lurks i know not what something mysterious dragons emblems symbolical figures the sky is too glaring the light crude implacable never has this old town of nagasaki appeared to me so old so worm-eaten so bald notwithstanding all its veneer of new papers and gaudy paintings these little wooden houses of such marvellous cleanly whiteness inside are black outside time-worn disjointed and grimacing when one looks closely this grimace is to be found everywhere in the hideous masks laughing in the shop fronts of the innumerable curio shops in the grotesque figures the playthings the idols cruel suspicious mad it is even found in the buildings in the friezes of the religious porticoes in the roofs of the thousand pagodas of which the angles and cable ends writhe and twist like the yet dangerous remains of ancient and malignant beasts and the disturbing intensity of expression reigning over inanimate nature contrasts with the almost absolute blank of the human countenance with the smiling foolishness of the simple little folk who meet one's gaze as they patiently carry on their minute trades in the gloom of their tiny open-fronted houses workmen squatted on their heels 
carving with their imperceptible tools the droll or odiously obscene ivory ornaments marvellous cabinet curiosities which have made japan so famous with the european amateurs who have never seen it unconscious artists tracing with steady hand on a background of lacquer or of porcelain traditional designs learned by heart or transmitted to their brains by a process of heredity through thousands of years automatic painters whose stalks are similar to those of monsieur sucre with the inevitable little rocks or little butterflies eternally the same the least of these illuminators with his insignificant eyeless face possesses at his fingers ends the maximum of dexterity in this art of decoration light and wittily incongruous which threatens to invade us in france in this epoch of imitative decadence and which has become the great resource of our manufacturers of cheap objects of art is it because i am about to leave this country because i have no longer any link to bind me to it any resting place on its soil that my spirit is ready on the wing i know not but it seems to me i have never as clearly seen and comprehended it as to-day and more even than ever do i find it little aged with worn-out blood and worn-out sap i feel more fully its antediluvian antiquity its centuries of mummification which will soon degenerate into hopeless and grotesque buffoonery as it comes into contact with western novelties it is getting late little by little the siestas are everywhere coming to an end the queer little streets brighten up and begin to swarm in the sunshine with many-coloured parasols now begins the procession of ugliness of the most impossible description a procession of long-robed grotesque figures capped with pot hats or sailors headgear business transactions begin again and the struggle for existence close and bitter here as in one of our own artisan quarters but meaner and smaller at the moment of my departure i find within myself only a smile of careless mockery for the swarming crowd of this lilliputian curtsying people laborious industrious greedy of gain tainted with a constitutional affectation hereditary insignificance and incurable monkeyishness poor cousin number four hundred and fifteen how right i was to have held him in good esteem he was by far the best and most disinterested of my japanese family when all my commissions are finished he puts up his little vehicle under a tree and much touched by my departure insists upon escorting me on board the triomphante to watch over my final purchases in the sampan which conveys me to the ship and to see them himself safely into my cabin his indeed is the only hand i clasp with a really friendly feeling without a suppressed smile on quitting japan no doubt in this country as in many others there is more honest friendship and less ugliness among the simple beings devoted to purely physical work at five o'clock in the afternoon we set sail along the line of the shore are two or three sampans in them the musmes shut up in the narrow cabins peep at us through the tiny windows half hiding their faces on account of the sailors these are our wives who have wished out of politeness to look upon us once more there are other sampans as well in which other japanese women are also watching our departure these stand upright under great parasols decorated with big black letters and daubed over with clouds of varied and startling colours chapter fifty four a fading picture we move slowly out of the wide green bay the groups of women grow smaller in the distance the country of round umbrellas with a thousand ribs fades gradually from our sight now the vast ocean opens before us immense colourless solitary a solemn repose after so much that is too ingenious and too small the wooded mountains the flowery capes disappear and japan remains faithful to itself with its picturesque rocks its quaint islands on which the trees tastefully arrange themselves in groups studied perhaps but charmingly pretty chapter fifty five a withered lotus flower one evening in my cabin in the midst of the yellow sea my eyes fall upon the lotus blossoms brought from du genji they had lasted several days but now they are withered and strew my carpet pathetically with their pale pink petals i who have carefully kept so many faded flowers fallen alas into dust stolen here and there at moments of parting in different parts of the world 
i who have kept so many that the collection is now an absurd an indistinguishable herbarium i try hard but without success to awaken some sentiment for these lotus and yet they are the last living souvenirs of my summer at nagasaki i pick them up however with a certain amount of consideration and i open my porthole from the grey misty sky a strange light falls upon the waters a dim and gloomy twilight descends yellowish upon this yellow sea we feel that we are moving northward that autumn is approaching i throw the poor lotus into the boundless waste of waters making them my best excuses for consigning them natives of japan to a grave so solemn and so vast an appeal to the gods o ama terase o mikami wash me clean from this little marriage of mine in the waters of the river of kamo end of section eight End of Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Lotti. Translated by Laura Ensor.